The Hot Boys were originally formed in 1996. They will release their first album, Get It How You Live, on October 28th of 1997 on Cash Money Records. Cash Money, who was independent at the time, will go on to move $400 units of the album. The Hot Boys will follow up with Guerrilla Warfare in 1999. Guerrilla Warfare will be the group's first commercially successful album, selling 142,000 copies in the first week and debut at number 5 on the Billboard Top 200. The album would be certified platinum by November 1st of 1999. The Hot Boys would break up in 2001. Juvenile, Turk, and BG would all eventually leave cash money due to issues with their finances. Lil Wayne will be the only original member left signed to the label. Despite the split, The Hot Boys' Lil Burn would still be released in 2003. During interviews, Manny Fresh would state that Lil Burn was composed of material originally recorded between 1998 and 2000. Many setbacks will prevent the group from having an official reunion. In 2006, Turk will be sentenced to 14 years in prison for second degree attempted crushing. Shortly before Turk's release in 2012, BG will be sentenced to 14 years in prison for possession of three toolies and witness tampering. This is the real story of the Hot Boys, all four members, and the reason they left Cash Money Records. BG is a solo artist, plus he's a member of the Hot Boys. Turk is a part of the Hot Boys. Lil Wayne is a part of the Hot Boys, which will be doing his solo album. And I know y'all all know Juvenile, who is a solo artist, and he's a Hot Boy. You got me and my dog, Fresh. He do all beat, game spitting, however you want to live it, nickname it how you want it. Sugar Slim call all shots, and I'm the number one stunt. Lil Wayne will begin his career as a preteen delivering hardcore southern hip-hop. Through years of maturation and prolific output, during which the delivery of his humorous wordplay and rhyme gradually changed from childlike and witty to stoned and raspy. Wayne would develop into a multi-million unit selling artist with a massive body of work, one so inventive and cunning that it makes his claim of being the best rapper alive worth considering by many. Wayne would debut at the age of 11 and receive his first platinum certification five years later as a member of the Hot Boys, immediately thereafter becoming a formidable solo artist with the release of The Block Is Hot in 1999. This would be his first of 12 top 10 albums on the Billboard 200 during a period of constant output entailing not just successful lengths but also reputation building mixtapes and featured appearances on pop hits like Destiny Child, Soldier. Wayne would reach mainstream superstar status with the release of The Carter 3 in 2008, a triple platinum blockbuster that will produce the number one pop hit, Lollipop, and the number six follow-up, Emily. The Carter 3 would net Wayne three Grammy Awards, including Best Rap Album, throughout the 2010s, despite numerous legal and creative battles. Wayne will continue to be a regular presence on the upper reaches of the charts with albums such as The Carter 4 that were released in 2011 and I'm Not a Human Being that were released in 2013, solidifying his status as a tour headliner all while continually lengthening his list of collaborative hits including the multi-platinum Sucker for Pain off the Suicide soundtrack in 2016 and the DJ Khaled Smash hit released in 2017. Wayne would top the Billboard 200 with consecutive LPs to Carter 5 in 2018 and Funeral in 2020. Weezy would continue to issue non-album singles and mixtape like his 2021 Rich the Kid collaboration, Crush One Babies, and 2023 Nobody featuring DMX. Born September 27, 1982, to Mesita, the Wayne Michael Carter Jr. will be raised in the infamous New Orleans neighborhoods of the 17th Ward, Holly Grove, and the New Orleans East. Throughout his school years, Lil Wayne would be a straight-A student. Two of the schools that he would attend would be Abe and McMahon. Wayne never felt his true intelligence was expressed through any kind of report card. He would find music was the best way to express himself, earning him the nickname Toon from his stepfather, Rabbit, who would sadly lose his life to the streets. After taking the name Gangsta D, he will begin writing Gangsta Rhyme. Combining a strong work ethic with aggressive self-promotion, at 11 years old, Wayne will convince Baby of Cash Money Records to sign him to the label. Sita, who was reluctant at first, would eventually allow Wayne to sign. A year later, Wayne and BG will partner with Manny Fresh and be dubbed the BGs and release the album True Stories. 
BG will go on to release Chopper City. In 1997, Wayne will be rumored to have accidentally shot himself in the chest. Wayne would later reveal in interviews and in his music that it wasn't an accident at all. He had actually tried to take his own life. The same year of the Chopper City release, Weezy will officially run with the moniker Lil Wayne. Wayne will go on to state that he dropped the D from his first name in order to separate himself from a father who had never been in his life. Wayne would join fellow label mates BG, the juvenile, and Turk to form the Hot Boys, who would release their debut album, Get It How You Live, in 1997. In 1998, Cash Money will sign a major distribution deal with Universal Records. With major mainstream distribution, the Hot Boys Gorilla Warfare album will reach the number one spot on Billboard's top R&B hip-hop albums chart list. In 1998, Lil Wayne was featured on Juvenile's hit single, Back That Thing Up that would appear on Juvie's 400 Degrees album. Wayne would launch his solo career a year later with the album The Block Is Hot, featuring the hit single The Block Is Hot. The album would go double platinum. Wayne still had not reached middle America as his hardcore rhymes and tough cash money sound had not yet crossed over. Wayne's second album, Lights Out, in 2000 will fail to match the success of The Block Is Hot. Lights Out will go gold. Wheezy will go on to feature on the big timers hit single, Number One Stunner. Wayne's audience will be rapidly growing. While Wayne will credit Fresh for being primarily responsible for launching his music career, Wheezy will be much closer to Brian Williams, aka Baby. When Juvie left the label, Wayne will show his loyalty to Baby by releasing 500 Degrees 2002, which would go gold. Rumors will begin to fly about Cash Money's financial troubles and possible demise. The rest of the Hot Boys had left. Wayne's planned 2003 album would be scrapped. It would instead be released as an underground mixtape called The Drought. Wayne would begin to singly handle and take over the mixtape world after The Drought had drawn so much attention from the hip-hop press. Weezy used these underground releases to build anticipation for his next official album, The Carter, that will be released in 2004. The single, Go DJ, will reach number five on the hip-hop singles chart. Wayne will go on to feature on Destiny Child single, Soldier. Wayne had officially crossed over. Wayne would continue to feed the streets with a slew of mixtapes released in 2005. Dedication with DJ Drama and the suffix with DJ Khaled. Cash Money's future was no longer in doubt, and traditional music business rules no longer seem to apply. Wayne's tracks will be leaked onto the internet in various DJ mixtapes. Get something with another bold move as a Universal Funded Video was made without the track ever seeing the light of day. With his alternative marketing scheme, working in overdrive, the 2005 release of the Carter 2 will be a major event, selling over a quarter million copies the week of its release. Fireman and Shooter with Robin Thicke will be released as singles. This album, for the first time, would have no production from Manny Fresh. The album will go platinum. Just from Wheezy, future Young Money label will appear on the album. The following year, Wayne the Baby will release Father Like Son album, which will feature the hit single, Stuntin' Like My Daddy. With his mixtape still flooding the underground, including Dedication 2, Wayne was bubbling. With no official follow-up to the Carter 2 in sight, numerous collaborative tracks will keep Wheezy in the mainstream like Gimme That by Chris Brown, Make It Rain by Fat Joe, and Duffel Bag Boys by Player Circle, all three becoming big hits. The Carter 3 that was slated for 2007 wouldn't drop until a year later. The Carter 3 would drop in May of 2008, selling more than a million copies in the first week. With an appearance on Saturday Night Live and a handful of Grammys, Wayne's mainstream acceptance would be undeniable. Wayne would go on to perform at the Country Music Awards with Kid Rock, where he would play the guitar. The guitar playing would be part of Wayne's new involvement with rock music, including his help in signing Kevin Rudolph to Cash Money Records, plus an appearance on Rudolph's massive hit, Let It Rock. Wayne would release his Young Money mixtape. Young Money is the Army, better yet, the Navy. The official album, We Are Young Money, would drop that same year. Wayne's Rebirth album would drop in early 2010. Shortly after, Wayne would be sentenced to nine months for a criminal possession of a firearm. Wayne would do his jokes in PC on Rikers Island. Free at last. After serving eight months in prison, Grammy Award-winning rap star Lil Wayne has been released from New York's Rikers Island. He was sent there after a loaded firearm was found on his tour bus last year in Manhattan. But prison has not halted the career of this popular artist. Lil Wayne released a new album in September titled I Am Not a Human Being, which topped the Billboard charts at number one last month. 
and with his first day out of captivity, there's already plans to celebrate. Close friends will host a lavish homecoming celebration for him in Miami this weekend, and industry insiders are buzzing about what's next. MTV reports that he might soon perform along with fellow star Drake in Las Vegas. Ken Lombardi, CBSNews.com, New York. The Quarter Four will finally drop in 2011. With the lead single, Six Foot Seven, the album will reach the top spot on the Billboard 200. In 2013, Wayne will be slammed with criticism for a controversial verse he spit on Future's Karate Shop, where he made a reference to Emmett Till, the young black teenager that was gruesome in 1955 by white men. Wayne will go on to release his second volume of I Am Not a Human Being. The album will debut at number two, featuring the singles No Worries and Love Me. A sequel of singles to make up for the delayed The Carter Five would ensue Believe Me featuring Drake in addition to Wayne's stockpile of certified platinum hits. Another track, Nothing But Trouble featuring Charlie, would drop in 2015 as a contribution to the soundtrack for 808 The Movie. That same year, to make up for fan disappointment over The Carter Five delays, Wayne will release Sorry For The Wait. In 2016, Wayne will become enrolled in the legal battle with Birdman in cash money records, further complicating the fate of the Carter Five. These continued delays will prompt the release of the Free Weezy album. By the end of the year, Wayne will publish a memoir about his time spent at Rikers Island, gone till November, and scored another hit with Sucker for Pain, a collaboration for the chart-topping Suicide soundtrack. The all-star track will top the Billboard rap charts and rise to number three on the R&B hip-hop charts. DJ Khaled will become one of Wayne's biggest collaborations the following year, topping the pop chart on his way to quintuple platinum. Wayne will finally drop the Carter Five after joining Blink-182 in 2019 for a cool headline tour and mashup single with My Age that will feature a broad range of guests, J-Rock, Lil Baby, in XX Extension. It will drop in January of 2020 and enter the Billboard 200 at the top. In July of the same year, Wayne will release his 2015 mixtape, The Free Weezy Album, as FWA. The project has seen an exclusive release only on one streaming service five years earlier, but the wider release will be different, with some tracks omitted completely and new mixes of songs that formerly included uncleared samples. 2021 will see the tracks BB King Freestyle featuring Drake and Funeral. Both will top the Billboard charts and the release Ain't Got Time. In October of that year, Wayne will team up with Rich the Kid for the 10 song mixtape Trust Fund Baby. The project included only one featured guest spot from YG. In January of 2022, Wayne's 2011 mixtape, Sorry for the Wait, would drop on streaming services for the first time. The newly refreshed version of the tape would include four songs recorded around the time of its re-release, including guest spots from Lil Tika and Alan Kubas. In February of 2023, Wayne would drop I Am Music. I Am Music would include some of Wayne's best known, best loved, and best performing songs from across his career. That album would debut at number 25 on the Billboard Top 200. Wayne had made it. His status in the music world had changed from rapper to rock star. All would be peaches and cream as Wayne's extracurricular activities would impact his health. I'm James Vallis. Hip-hop artist Lil Wayne's private plane has made an emergency landing in Nebraska after he suffered a seizure and blacked out, according to reports, which say he has since regained consciousness and is refusing treatment. The incident happened on Monday afternoon when Wayne was flying in a private jet from Milwaukee in Wisconsin to California. It forced the aircraft to divert to Omaha in Nebraska, where it made an emergency landing. An ambulance responded to the scene and checked out Wayne, according to TMZ.com, which said Wayne had since regained consciousness and is refusing medical treatment. Other details were not immediately available. There was no immediate comment from authorities or Wayne's representatives. Stay with BNONews.com for the very latest and follow us on Twitter throughout the day for breaking news updates as it happens at BNO News.
Rapper Lil Wayne was rushed to the hospital after he was found unconscious in Chicago. Reports say he suffered multiple seizures in a hotel room yesterday. The 34-year-old was forced to cancel his Las Vegas performance last night. Just last year, the rapper's private plane made an emergency landing after he suffered a seizure. Four years ago, Lil Wayne revealed he is epileptic and prone to seizures. In the valley last night, a Grammy Award winning rapper has been detained at a border checkpoint on possession of Mountain Action Force Rafael Carranza has the latest. That's right, Lacey, you heard about it here first on Action 4 News. Rapper Lil Wayne was detained at the Falfurias checkpoint earlier today, according to a Border Patrol supervisor. These are YouTube images of Lil Wayne's concert at the Dodge Arena on Thursday. This afternoon, agents in Falfuri has detained 12 people, including the popular rapper, on board two tour buses. Uh, one of our U.S. Border Patrol canine teams alerted to the possible presence of people or narcotics on the bus. That uh, led to a secondary inspection, at which time they found Juana, not on any one person, but in the bus. But they are not releasing how much. Thursday's concert was his first trip to the Valley. The amateur video posted on YouTube of last night's concert... <laughs> Shows him performing in front of a packed house. Lil Wayne is a rapper with Cash Money, Universal Motown Records. His real name is Dwayne Michael Carter Jr. He was scheduled to perform in Laredo tonight, but that event was postponed. Yeah, there was some fans uh, outside, uh, and we did make the announcement to them. Uh, you know, they were obviously disappointed, but uh, you know, we didn't have any incidents or anything like that. The general manager at the Laredo Entertainment Center, where he was scheduled to perform, tells Action 4 News they are working on setting up a new date. Lil Wayne has another scheduled performance in Corpus Christi on Sunday, but it is unclear if that concert has been postponed as well. Reporting in the newsroom, Rafael Carranza, Action 4 News. Now at 11, police have cleared the scene at a Miami Beach mansion. They raided the place this evening with a celebrity's prized possessions as their target. Rapper Lil Wayne owes someone a lot of money and he isn't paying, so police showed up to collect. CBS 4's Kerry Codd has more. Miami-Dade police descended on the Miami Beach mansion of rapper Lil Wayne Tuesday afternoon. According to police, they were serving a warrant in a civil case to seize property. We're told police forced their way into the rapper's home, valued at $10.3 million. TMZ is reporting that the police took items to satisfy a court judgment against Lil Wayne for $2 million. TMZ says the judgment is for money the rapper owes to a private jet company. What did police take? TMZ reports that authorities carted out some of Lil Wayne's pricey pieces of art and says he has about $30 million worth of art in his home. All the drama here didn't seem to bother this community too much. I spoke to a couple of neighbors off camera. They told me they've never had any problems with Little Wayne and that they've found him to be an excellent neighbor. This isn't the first time there's been police activity at Wayne's home. Back in March, the Miami Beach SWAT team was called to the house for a prank call of people being shot at the home. During Tuesday's police raid, we're told Wayne wasn't home at the time officers arrived. TMZ reports he's in Los Angeles. On Miami Beach, Kerry Codd, CBS 4 News Tonight. I'm new at 5, trouble for rapper Lil Wayne. He was charged with possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. According to court documents, today's development stems from a trip to Miami on a private plane last December. That's when authorities say they found the weapon during a search of the jet. The rapper is expected in federal court next month and faces up to 10 years in prison if he's convicted. We're also just getting this. A few minutes ago here tonight, the Miami Herald is reporting federal agents have found guns and coke in a private plane that landed at Miami Opalaka Executive Airport today. The paper reports rapper Lil Wayne was on that plane, which brought him here, they say, from California. The report says charges could be filed soon in federal court. His lawyer tells the Herald his client was allowed to leave the airport tonight. The FBI and the ATF are handling the case. At 5.05 this morning, new from overnight in one of his last acts as President Donald Trump issued a long list of pardons. And included on that list, New Orleans native and rapper Lil Wayne, along with his former chief strategist Steve Bannon. Bannon was accused of defrauding millions of dollars in a fundraising campaign supposedly aimed at supporting President Trump's border wall. The president himself, along with members of his family, were not pardoned. He doesn't have to announce a pardon. 
It could be done mm. in private and stuck in his pocket, and we wouldn't know it until he was indicted and pulled it out for defense. Same with the, the kids. And the pardons were issued very early this morning, even earlier than this morning. This was the story of Lil Wayne, a.k.a. Wheezy F. Baby. Terry is great, born March 26, 1975, would be raised in Uptown New Orleans, the third ward. One of the schools that Terry would attend would be Our Lady of Grace Catholic School. Terry who first began recording his raps in the early 90s. His debut album would be Being Myself, which was released in 1995 on Warlock Records. The album would go on to do fairly well on the local scene. In 97, Juvie would release Soldier Rags under the Cash Money imprint. Soldier Rags would be Juvenile's debut album with Cash Money Records. Soldier Rags would chart on a Billboard Hot R&B Hip Hop song list. The Soldier Rags album would be Juvie's first time working with Manny Fresh. In 1997, Juvenile would join the Hot Boys with fellow Cash Money rappers BG, Turk, and Lil Wayne. The Hot Boys would release their debut album titled Get It How you live under the cash money imprint. The rest will be history. This is the story of Tanut, aka Juvenile. Juvie, who grew up in the third ward, would not only have roots in the Noya. Juvie's grandmother on his mother's side would be from the Melf. Juvie's mother and his dad's mother would both be from the Noya. As a young kid, Juvie would go back and forth between the two. Juvie would compare coming up in the Noya to the poverty-stricken low-income neighborhoods of the Bronx in New York. Coming up as a youth in the Noya would be somewhat of a brotherhood for Juvie. Everyone would look out for each other. Being raised in the Noya was rough. Juvie's lowest point, being raised in the Noya, would be coming home from school to find that they had been evicted. All of their furniture would be sitting on the sidewalk. Seeing people being crushed would be the worst thing that Juvie would experience as a kid. Juvie would be nine years old when he would witness his first crushing. It would take place in the mouth. Playing in the courtyard with the rest of the kids, Juvie would witness Tiger out the mouth get deleted. Juvie's grandmother lived in the worst part of the mill. The crushing of Tiger would take place in front of her door. Being raised on the old side of the Noya, Juvie would actually experience more violence in the mill. Crushings would be traumatizing at first to the young Juvie, but they would soon become normalized in his mind. By the age of 11, Juvie would be toting a knife. By the age of 14, he would be packing two blicks. When the epidemic would hit in the 80s, Juvie would try his hand at hustling. Not willing to risk his life for the streets, Juvie would scale back and slang puffies, all while being one of the neighborhood barbers. This would turn out to be lucrative for Juvie, as he was bringing in pretty much the same bread as his homies that were slinging that hard. Bounce music would explode in the 90s. East Coast rappers would inspire Juvie to start rapping. Not being athletic, rap would be Juvie's thing. He would enter talent shows and gong shows throughout the city. Juvie was so cold at rapping that some of his teachers would allow him to rap the curriculum for a passing grade. Contrary to popular belief, Juvie would not be signed to Warlock Records when he dropped his first body of work. Juvie would sell the album to Warlock Records for a said amount. The relationship with Warlock would happen after Juvie had already written the DJ Jimmy album, which would feature the single Bounce for the Juvenile. It wouldn't be long before Juvie would sign with Cash Money. The day that Juvie would walk through the doors of Cash Money, they would release their entire roster for the exception of BG and Wayne. Juvie, who was working as an environmental specialist at the time, would be approached by Baby and Slim while he was waiting on the bus. Not willing to quit his job, Juvie would pose a proposition to Baby and Slim. That proposition would be $2,000 a week plus a three week advance. Baby and Slim would get back to Juvie the next day, agreeing to the deal. Being a big fan of UNLV at the time, Juvie would base his decision on being able to work with Manny Fresh. In 97, Juvie would drop Soldier Rags under the Cash Money imprint. The Soldier Rag album would chart on Billboard. Not satisfied with just charting, Juvie would go harder on his next project. Lil Wayne, an up and coming superstar, would feature on the Soldier Rags album. Juvie would be noted in an interview stating that Wayne was a monster at a young age. At his age, Cita would not allow Wayne to use profanity in his rap, which would speak even more on how talented Wayne was. The same year, the Hot Boys would be formed with BG, Wayne, Juvie, and Turk. BG Derek, aka Bulletproof, would feature on several Cash Money songs before losing his life in 2002. Get It How You Live would be the Hot Boys debut album. Get It How You Live will go on to become a classic. You can hear the hunger in all of the artists on the album. The album will be recorded in only four 
days. The work ethic of Manny Fresh will be unmatched. He will produce five or six songs a night in the studio. Cash Money's big break would come in 1998 with the Universal Record deal. Unbeknownst to many, CMR had been shopping around the proposals of the majors for nearly a year and a half prior to signing with Universal. In the deal, Cash Money was signed for three years. The $30 million distribution deal would entail a $2 million advance each year a credit for $1.5 million for each of the six artists that they would have at the time. After recouping, Universal Records will retain 15% of profits from the album sales, while Cash Money will retain 85 as well as 50% of their publishing royalties and ownership of all master recordings. The deal will be brokered by consultant Wendy Day. At the time of obtaining the deal, Slim and Baby were young to the industry. Not fully understanding the music business at the time, many financial mistakes will be made. The Big Timers, How You Love That, which had already dropped independently, will be repackaged and redistributed under Universal Records. It will be the first album to drop under the Universal deal. Per Stunner, in an interview with The Source magazine, their intentions were to release the Hotball albums as their next project. Universal would not be on board with this move and demand the release of Juvie's album. That album would be 400 Degrees. Juvie will release Ha as the first single off the album. 400 Degrees will release to slow album sales. It will be the release of the single following now a Carlos Santana sample that would ignite the flames. Jay-Z would unexpectedly remix Han and send it to Cash Money. CMR would re-release 400 Degrees with the Jay-Z remix in the Follow Me Now single. Follow Me Now would be that crossover hit that you needed. Back That Ass Up that already started taking off on the club scene would be the next single to drop off of 400 Degrees. Album sales were skyrocket. Fun fact, Juvie was against releasing Back That Ass Up as a single. The bounce era was behind Juvie. He didn't want to be known for booty shaking music. Juvie, who had initially recorded Back That Ass Up in third person, wasn't feeling the vibe. He would switch his flow up, re-record, the rest would be history. In the spring of 98, Positive Black Talk Incorporated, which was the company that owned the label that local bounce DJ artist DJ Jubilee was a part of, would release Back That Ass Up. Jubilee wrote the lyrics to his version of Back That Ass Up and would apply for and receive a certificate of registration from the United States Copyright Office for the words of the song. Jubilee would also obtain a certificate of registration for the words and music in the sound recording of Back That Ass Up. In November of 98, CMR will release Juvenile's 400 Degree album with the single Back That Ass Up. On February the 15th of 2002, PBT would make an application for supplementary registration with the Copyright Office, alleging that PBT should have been listed as the author and copyright claimant on Jubilee's prior registration of the words Back That Ass Up. That same date, PBT would file an instant suit asserting that it holds the copyright for Jubilee's recording and that juveniles back that ass up, infringes their copyright, and violates various other laws. Positive Black Talk would go on to lose the lawsuit. Back that ass up was so hot that Mystical would go on to release Shake Your Ass as an attempt at emulating Back That Ass Up. Drake, years later, would go on to remake the hit single. The song would be titled Practice. 400 Degrees will go on to become four times platinum. The following year, the Hot Boys Guerrilla Warfare will be released. It will go certified platinum. Juvie, who wasn't on the song, I Need a Hot Girl, would like Turk's verse so much that he would drop an entire song titled Project Chick. To Nut will go on to drop the G Code with the hit single, You Understand. G Code will go certified double platinum. Although G Code would have great success, Puffy would advise Juvie that the 400 Degrees album could have been worked more. There were multiple songs on the album that could have been released as singles. Being uneducated to the mainstream music business at the time, Brian Williams, aka Baby, and Ronald Williams, aka Slim, would not heed Puffy's advice. The Rough Riders Cash Money Tour would launch in 2000. Juvie, who was a student of the game, would recognize DMX as a legend with huge stage presence. Juvie would refuse to perform after X, knowing that his stage presence was nowhere near the caliber of X. It wouldn't be long before CMR would drop Border Block in the movie. Juvie's Project English album would follow in 2001. Project English would go certified platinum. Juvie, who wasn't happy about the bread that he was bringing in, wouldn't be around much for the Project English album. Project English would be a hodgepodge of songs that didn't make previous albums. Juvie the Great 
will be released in 2003 after the negotiating of better terms between Juvie and CMR. The Magnolia Slim song, Slow Motion, that was basically given to Juvie to go on a Slim nationwide attention, will go on to rank number one on the hip-hop charts. Slim would unfortunately lose his life before being able to enjoy the success of the single. Amidst financial turmoil with CMR, Juvenile would branch out in 2001 to establish his own record label with his brother Corey as the CEO. The label would be UTP, Uptown Project Records. The label's albums would be distributed by Orpheus and EMI. The initial roster would be Skip, Young Buck, Wacko, and Juvenile himself. Juvie would later part ways with Buck. Buck would go on to sign with 50 Cent. Most of the majors wanted to rock with Juvie outside of Skip and Wack. Both Skip and Wack were not really rappers. They were street dudes who could spit. Wack would have the streets on fire with the original version of Know Your Clap. It wouldn't be until 2004 when Houston would host the Super Bowl that Juvie would run across Jay Prince in the club. Juvie, Skip, and Wack would run their pitch to Jay Prince. They would play their shit for Jay Prince on the tour bus. The music was so fire that Jay Prince would invite them to the compound and offer to put them out on his rap a lot imprint. Bubbling from the slow motion single, UTP would release the Know Your Clap remix on Rap a Lot Records. It wouldn't be long before Atlantic Records would jump on board. Atlantic would put its focus on Juvie. The Know Your Clap remix would be one of the hottest songs in the country. Atlantic would ignore this and never put out a second UTP single. The city would be ravaged by Katrina shortly thereafter. This would be the start of the demise of UTP. Ultimately, bad paperwork would prevent Wack from getting his royalties for the Know Your Clap remix. Baby and Slim would backdoor and go with the move on Juvie for the slow motion record. Juvie would be gone for CMR for six years. In 2019, Juve and Stunner will release Just Another Gangster. Juvie would always bump into Slim and Baby. If they had an event they wanted Juvie to be a part of, he would be there in good spirit and faith. These interactions would lead to the men sharing more of a collective vision. Baby would be noted stating that they had been talking for years. This time around, they wanted to do things the right way, at the right time, with the right music. In 2023, Juvenile will collaborate with Urban South, a local brewery, to create Juvie Juice. The beverage will be inspired by Juvenile's favorite drink, the Arnold Palmer. It will be the brewery's first time releasing a hard iced tea. Juvie Juice is 5% by volume. It's available in 12 ounce and 19.2 ounce cans. It's available at Urban South's tap room, restaurant, and grocery stores nationwide. This move would stand to be a lucrative one for Juvie. The global beer market size was estimated at $680.9 billion in 2021 and is expected to reach over $731.6 billion. Juvie would also launch his own furniture line, Made by Juvie. Made by Juvie is a luxury furniture brand specializing in custom lights, tables, chairs, liquor dispensers for your home, office, or studio. In 2000, Juvenile will be arrested for aggravated assault and battery for an incident that took place in his Mandeville home. Shortly after, Juvie will be taken into custody by the NOPD on charges stemming from an alleged routine traffic stop. Officers would recover perp in that saw from the rented vehicle that Juvie was a passenger of. In the summer of 2002, Juvenile will be arrested for assaulting his barber over bootlegging his music. In January of 2003, Juvie would again be arrested, this time on drug charges. In February of 2003, Juvie would be sentenced to 75 hours of community service for a fight that took place outside of Florida nightclub. On January 25th of 2010, Juvenile will be arrested in Araby, Louisiana. A nosy neighbor will call the police reporting the smell of that perp. Juvie will be cited on a misdemeanor charge of possession and later be released on bond. Juvie will plead guilty in August of 2010 and receive a suspended three-month jail sentence and six months of probation. Juvie will again be arrested in 2012 for breathing the brakes off a dude in Club Live. This was the story of Tanut, a.k.a. Juvenile. Tab Virgil Jr. was born February 8, 1981, in New Orleans, Louisiana, to Miss Gail and Tab Virgil Sr. Growing up in the Magnolia Projects in the third ward, one of the schools that Turk would attend would be Elsie Forche. Before later dropping out in 2010, the life of Turk's younger brother will be taken in the streets. The hardships were not over for Turk as he would lose his father to a hit and run accident October 30th of 2013. This is the story of Tab Virgil Jr., a.k.a. Hot Boy Turk.
Turk's first appearance on the New Orleans rap scene would be with Hype Enough Record. He would be a member of the Young Gunners. In 1996, Turk would hook up with Ronald Williams, a.k.a. Sugar Slim, and Brian Williams, a.k.a. Baby. It wouldn't be long before Turk would be recruited as one of the original members of the High Boys, which consisted of Juvenile, BG, and Lil Wayne. Being the biggest draw on Cash Money Records back then, the High Boys would gain international success and go on to create the new Cash Money sound. Turk would make his recording debut with a cameo on Juvenile's Soldier Rag. Turk would go by the moniker Young Turk on Juvie's album. The newly formed High Boys group would drop Get It, How You Live in 1997 and Guerrilla Warfare two years later. Turk would continue to make cameos on other recordings, including Juvenile's 400 Degrees, The G Code, Lil Wayne's The Block Is Hot, and Lights Out, as well as BG, It's All On You, Volume 1, and Volume 2. In June of 2001, Turk would release his solo debut under the Cash Money imprint, Young and Duggan, on Universal Records. Turk would record Untamed Guerrilla on Cash Money as a follow-up. Untamed Gorilla would never be released by CMR. Turk will go on to make his Cox debut in 2003 with Raw and Uncut. After the split of the Hot Boys in 2001, Turk would begin his solo career. Turk's career after his first and second solo albums would halt after his third album, Penitentiary Chances, was released in 2004. Feeling virtually unstoppable since his release, Turk's first project after coming home from prison would be Blame It on a system where he intended to let his fans know that he was a force to be reckoned with. Turk would go on to do multiple interviews, appear on different shows, media outlets, make new music, and has even started his own label, YNT Empire. Picking up where he left off before prison, Turk was ready to take the world by storm with hopes to inspire others who are on the brink of giving up. Turk will put the details in his tell-all book. Turk will be quoted as saying, I am letting the world know my story. Turk was ready to let the world see beyond the former hot boy from Cash Money and get to know the real Turk, who had triumphed over the challenges he faced in his career, as well as his personal life from post-incarceration trauma. His law wife Imani struggled to keep it together after having kids and surviving cancer. In February of 2015, Turk would file a lawsuit against Cash Money Records for $1.3 million over unpaid royalties for recordings dating back to 1999. The lawsuit would seek to compel his former label to provide an account of every song Turk was on and had written. Attorneys for cash money would never follow a response, even after being given a 30-day extension. In May, it would appear that Turk had won the suit by default. The tables would turn as Turk would ask Judge Kirk Englehart to dismiss the suit, saying the two parties had reached an amicable settlement. In an interview with HipHop.com, Turk would say that while he was taken care of when he was a member of the High Boys, he has never saw any of of his royalty money. Turk would go on to tell HipHop.com when it came to the business side, there were things that he didn't know coming into the game as a youngster. Throughout years of reading and researching, Turk would realize that the numbers weren't adding up. For Turk, no one from CMR reached out to him upon his release from prison. On January 26 of 2004, an informant was disclosed to the Shelby County Sheriff's Office that junkies were getting loaded at the residence of Erica McLean at 2740 Hickory Village Drive, apartment number two in Memphis, Tennessee. The informant would also say that weapons were present in the apartment. The Sheriff's Office would then obtain a search warrant for the apartment, naming three individuals, including Turk. The officer who obtained the warrant suspected that there might be armed individuals inside the apartment. A SWAT team would be enlisted to assist in the execution of the warrant. At approximately 2 p.m., the officers knocked and announced their presence at the door of the apartment. After not receiving a response, 8 to 12 seconds after knocking, the SWAT team would kick the door in. Immediately after entering, Officer Gary Rogers would secure Sean Jackson, who was in the living room, located in the front of the apartment. The other officers would head towards the bathroom and bed bedroom located in the back of the apartment. Rogers would ask Jackson whether anyone else was in the apartment. Jackson would reply, a guy and a girl are in the bedroom. Before the SWAT officers would enter the apartment, Turk and his girlfriend Erica McLean were lying on the bed in the back bedroom. Upon hearing the SWAT team kick in the door, Erica would jump up and hide under the bed. Before hiding underneath the bed, she would witness Turk get off the bed and head in the opposite direction toward the closet. When the officers entered the bedroom, they did not see Turk or Erica. 
Officer Chris Harris will proceed to the closet to determine whether anyone was hiding inside. As Harris approached the closet, the door appeared to be shut and one was partially open. After walking towards the open closet door, Harris noticed movement inside of the closet. Harris would open the closet door and be hit in the jaw. He and his fellow officers responded by firing multiple shots at the closet door. After the exchange of gunfire, Harris and the other officers retreated outside of the bedroom to reload their weapons and to get medical treatment for Harris. At this time, Officer Perry McEwen would hear a female voice screaming from inside of the bedroom. Officer McEwen would instruct the woman to come out with her hands visible. McLean then crawled out of the bedroom down the hallway on her knees and hands. After McLean exited the bedroom, McEwen repeated his instructions to Turk, who would also crawl out on his hands and knees. After apprehending Turk, Officer McEwen would ask him if anyone else was in the bedroom. Officer Terry Bishop would then ask who was the shooter. Turk would acknowledge that he was the shooter and that he thought he was being robbed. Following the shooting, the officers would apply for and receive a crime scene search warrant, authorizing a search for blood, fingerprints, hair, fibers, weapons, trace evidence, and bullets within the apartment. In conducting the search, officers found six 9mm shell casings and a 9mm pistol in a bedroom closet. The officers would also find spoons containing dog food residue inside the apartment. On March 31st of 2004, a grand jury in the United States District Court for the Western District of Tennessee will return a one count indictment against Turk in connection with the incident charging him with being a felon in possession of a firearm. On November 10th of 2004, a superseding indictment against Turk would be entered, charging Turk with being a felon in possession of a firearm. Being a fugitive from justice in possession of a firearm and being a unlawful user of a controlled substance in possession of a firearm. Tab Virgil Jr. was released from the Forest City, Arkansas Federal Prison October 12, 2012. Turk was a member of the Hot Boys on Cash Money Records from 1996 to 2001. Turk's career was the real when he was busted in a raid that involved trigger play with the Memphis, Tennessee SWAT team. Since his release, Turk has went on to pen a book, release new music, and has also been rumored to be working on a screenplay about his life titled Reckless. With the Memphis incident and Cash Money lawsuit behind him, Turk is looking on to bigger and better things like the rumored Hot Boy reunion slated to take place after the release of Christopher Dorsey, a.k.a. BG. This was the story of Hot Boy Turk. New Orleans, home of Marie Laveau. Twenty-four hour to go daiquiris, Cafe Dumont, beignets, Cubic pies, and second line Sundays. The NO has also been tagged as the capital of the world. Derek Leon Williams, son of Dorothy Harris and Benny Butler Jr., was born December 15, 1980. Named after Mrs. Dorothy's uncle, the newborn Derek would be his mother's pride and joy. As an infant, Derek and Miss Dorothy would reside in Alexandria, Louisiana for a short stint, but would later relocate to the 10th Ward in New Orleans, Louisiana. Derek would still be a toddler when his father would be sentenced to 10 years in Angola. This would leave the very proud and strong Miss Darty to play the role of both mother and father. Yam would play a huge role in Derek's life. Far from shy, the young Derek was outspoken and wouldn't hesitate to speak his mind. Derek was musically inclined at a young age and would learn to play a full set of drums early in his life. Derek would come up masking Indian as an adolescent running flag boy. If you know anything about masking Indian, you would know that your wordplay had to be aggressive and on point. It was these skills that would later play a part in Derek's rap style. Contrary to popular belief, 
in other videos on the topic, Derek is not out the Thomas, nor has he, or Miss Darkey, ever lived in the STP. Derek would hang and do his thing in the Thomas, but would be respected throughout the entire uptown area. Always wanted to be aware of who was around him. If he didn't check your temperature himself, he would send somebody else on a mission to do it. Derek was a smooth talking ladies man that was always fly, who wasn't afraid of letting you know it. Revered by friends and family as someone that would give you the shirt off his back, Derek would be recognized as a good dude. Known for having an instigative sense of humor, Derek would drive you if you let him, aka put that will in your back. Derek's biggest talent would be spitting game aka rapping, which he would develop a strong passion for. His flamboyant yet witty lyrics would set him aside from his peers. Ms. Darty Harris, mother of LaDerek, was also sister to Brian Williams, aka Birdman, and Ronald Williams, aka Slim of Cash Money Records. Although not raised together, they would all still recognize each other as family. Ms. Darty would be closer to her sister Kim than she was with Ronald and Brian. These blood ties would obviously make Derek Baby and Slim's nephew. Promises from Baby that he would put Derek on his feet made Derek Williams, aka Bulletproof, go even harder with his music. Derek would have dreams and aspirations of taking Miss Darty out of the hood. Derek would often share his sentiments with his mom. Miss Darty, frustrated with the dreams being sold to her son, would be vocal about her lack of confidence in Baby and Slim to put Derek on his feet. Ms. Darty was confident that Derek would be successful without the help of cash money records. Derek would idolize and look up to his uncle baby, giving himself the name the number two stunner. This would be well deserved as Derek was known for throwing money at clubs and rocking the newest iceberg gear which was the hottest thing smoking at the time. At the age of 19, little Derek would be pushing a white vet in Harley Davidson truck through the main streets of the Inno, always making sure to show off his mouth full of slugs. Although he would not actually be signed to the label, BG Derek would feature on several songs and would make several cameos in cash money videos. Being deeper in the streets than the artists at the time, Baby would look at Derek as a bad influence. It is rumored that little Derek would encourage the artists to run the streets of Uptown with him taken away from their studio time. A stunner who didn't want his artists in the streets would not like this. It is alleged that a vote will be taken to remove Derek from being a part of the Hot Boys. The vote had been taken, the decision had been made. Baby and Slim will switch up their game and have the artist avoid Derek. They would go as far as going back and forth to different studios to prevent Derek from popping up. Things had changed and Derek knew it. Realizing that he wasn't going to be a part of the Hot Boys, it was time for Derek, who had money of his own, to make a decision. February 2nd, 1999. Deshaun Lewis would launch Smoked Out Records. On August 24th of 1999, Smoked Out Records will release Bustin' Heads and Getting Paid with BG's Derek Smash Hit, Be Honest, and the singles Bustin' Heads and Getting Paid featuring Birdman and Lil Wayne. On June 19, 2001, Smoked Out Records were released Done Did It that featured mecca producer Manny Fresh and artists such as Pimp C, Young Buck, Lil Turk, Big Rap, and a repeat of the single Bustin' Heads and Getting Paid featuring Birdman and Lil Wayne. This run wouldn't last long as Deshaun would get busted. Derek would partner with his homies of the 10th, Sko, Butch, and Chuck to start Knockout Entertainment. The hood classic Undisputed Champions will be released on the label. Derek Leon Williams, aka La Derek, aka Bulletproof, aka BG Derek, would not get to enjoy the spoils of his labor as his life will be sadly taken Halloween night of 2002. Cash Money Records will go on to sell over 500 million albums. Birdman, who understood 
the ever-changing hip-hop game will start moving outside of the box in 2013. Baby would also launch YMCMB Enriched Gang clothing line that had everyone from Drake to Justin Bieber rocking it. Being in the game for over two decades, CMR is now the biggest rap label in the music industry. Miss Darty will go on to author her first book, The Mother of a Stunner, which can be found on Amazon. A link to Miss Darty's book will be pinned in the comments. You can also still find all of La Derrick's music online at various outlets, as well as here on the platform in various streaming services. And don't forget to check out Miss Darty's book on Amazon.com. Link in the description. There have been more than 200 so far this year in New Orleans. Money side side, Uptown, 13th Ward, Valence and Magnolia would raise one of the realest artists to come out of the city of New Orleans. They pulled us over. Uh, they found guns in the car. They found guns in the car. And um, as of right now, none of mine. Capital. It's the capital, man. They dropping like flies. You know, I'm 16, 17, 18. You know what I'm saying? I'm riding around in the bands. You know, I'm blinging. You know what I'm saying? I got stacks in my pocket. Look, everybody know what's happening with me, man. You know what I'm saying? I've been in the game for 14 years. And the same way I came in the game, that's the same way I'm going out. Tell Baby, yeah. I want my fucking money. BG, AKA B Jizzle, AKA Jizzle. A.K.A. Doogie was born Christopher Darcy on September 3rd, 1980. Doogie would lose his pops to Alice at a young age. Jizzle's pop would be found during an apparent failed robbery. Before the untimely death of his father, B.G. would be a young deacon at his grandfather's church. Losing his father at the age of 12 would be traumatizing to the young Christopher. Per Miss Sin, B.G.'s mother, this is when Jizzle's life would take a turn. BG would cut class and begin to hang out with the street dudes in the hood. This is when BG would develop a love for BG would be 12 years of age when he was spit for Brian, Baby Williams, in front of Stan, the barber. Per Doogie, Baby would brainwash him and groom him at a young age. I mean, if you love me like you say you love me, you know what I'm saying, then you wouldn't want to see me, you know what I'm saying, destroy myself like that. So evidently, you know what I'm saying, you wanted me in that position. Cash Money Records would have a strong local roster that would bring in cash by the boatload. In 95, the label would begin to lose artists. Bill Yah would be admitted to DePaul Mental Hospital. Tech Nine would catch a Jose, Pimp Daddy, and Yellow Boy would both. Before Terrence Gangster Williams would catch a life sentence, Doogie would run with Gangster in the Noya and even mention Gangster in several of his songs. It is alleged that Gangster gave Jizzle the name Baby Gangster. The loss of artists would leave the weight of the label on Doogie and Manny Fresh. An unfortunate turn of events will lead to BG catching his first gun charge at the age of 16 for a weapon that wasn't his. It is alleged that Cash Money will get the Universal Records contract due to the consistency of the BG albums. In 97, Cash Money skyrocketed into the mainstream. Feeling like he wasn't getting his fair share of the pie, BG would leave Cash Money Records in 2000, 2001, and start his own label, Chopper City Records, which was distributed through Koch Records. In 2003, Doogie would launch his own rap group that consisted of Snipe, Gar, and Hot Kizzle. The group would be the Chopper City Boys, who would later add VL Mike in 2004. VL Mike would grow frustrated with internal issues inside the label concerning money. This would be the start of the beef with Jizzle, BG and Mike were from the same street circle, so this would get interesting. You want to keep it on wax, keep it on wax, dog. But if I see it's depending on how I'm feeling that fucking day, you heard me? Because I don't fall up in, bitch, like I told you. Mike, who had blood ties to the Hankins, would still show love to Miss Sin and Miss Carol while dropping diss tracks on Doogie and talking grimy about him in the streets. VL Mike would later be murdered in 2008. The internet will be filled with rumors implying that Doogie had something to do with my VL Mike's brother, would take to the internet to dead those rumors. Got the internet be BG yeah. had something to do with VL Mike, you know, because of that distance shit, but on some real hood shit, you know what I'm saying? You know, and 
I ain't never really spoke on it live or nothing to nobody. He ain't had shit to do, you know what I'm saying? That's my nigga. Even though, you know, that's my brother, you know, Bill. God bless the dead, you know, and shit. Nigga was tripping, you know, some little shit, whatever they little different was. I really don't know. You know what I'm saying? Right. But I was gone. So when I came home, I just fell into all the shit in. Me and Doge still really ain't talk. You know what I'm saying? To this day. Unable to seal an arrest warrant for BG, the NOPD was starting an all-out harassment campaign against Jizzle. In 2009, BG will be pulled over for an alleged routine traffic stop. The NOPD will recover three weapons, two of which they say were stolen from the hot Chevy Tahoe, which allegedly was a stolen rental car. Oogie would be arrested along with Demone Pollard and Gerard Fetty Federson. NOPD would put the gun charges on Jizzle and Fetty and the drug charges they would put on Demone, who was only 17 at the time. Fetty would later take to the stand as a witness in a Teddy Hankton trial where he would implicate BG in street crimes. After BG's arrest, witness tampering charges will be brought up on Jizzle. The government calls Gerard Fetterson. Are you cooperating today in hopes of getting a reduced sentence off of that 240 month sentence? Yes, ma'am. Now, if I can take you back a little bit to the 13th Ward, who are some of the individuals that you knew from growing up in the 13th? Me, Aaron Smith, Brian Hayes, Walter Porter, Terrence Lodrick, Christopher Dorsey. And who were some of the people that you were closest to? Me, Aaron Smith, Christopher Dorsey, Brian Hayes, Walter Porter. And did you have a nickname on the street? Yes, ma'am. Fetty. The prosecutor would be outraged that Jizzle would not cooperate with the government, attempting to give him 30 years. The judge would slam down the gavel and say, 30 years is ludicrous for this charge. Jizzle would end up with a 14-year sentence. It is rumored that prosecutors wanted Jizzle to turn over on the Telly Hankton organization. Jizzle stood tall in the paint and didn't say, not one word. And a New Orleans rapper has been sentenced to 14 years in prison for illegal possession of firearms and obstructing justice. Christopher Dorsey, also known as BG, was also sentenced to three years of supervised release by a federal judge. The 28-year-old pleaded guilty in December to being a felon with a firearm after being caught by the NOPD. Jizzle walked that 14-year Joe's down like a big dog is supposed to. Stood tall in the paint, and he'd be home in a minute. Jizzle is short, like real short. You might see that boy home sometime this year, maybe in June, something like that. It is alleged that he would be resigning with Baby and Cash Money Records upon his release. There's a few videos on YouTube of Baby and Hot going and visit that boy. But after 13 years, one visit, I don't know if I'm rocking like that.